Who is that guy or that girl from your office and what did they do to earn that title? Story 1. Previous job, let's call him Marty. Every day was Marty's worst day and each day worse than the last. He hated life. We worked together as copy editors for a magazine. He was a short man with a glorious thick head of hair and the craziest voice, kind of like Woody Allen and any quintessentially 40s mobster. He had a Barry Gibbs haircut, and as he'd stomp through the office with his pants hiked up to his neck, he'd shake his glorious feathered mane. He had every job imaginable, and was also a lawyer, a real estate lawyer, where he'd tell us about how he had to go to tenants' homes and survey living conditions in one of the worst cities in the Northeast. Marty was also married to a woman he hated, let's call her Stella. Stella hated to move, at all, especially off the couch, and we're not sure if she worked or not. He and Stella lived in a one-bedroom condo together and had been married for only three years. We don't know how they met or what they had in common, but he hated her and grimaced every time he brought her name up. Marty was an avid biker. He ate only raw food, so you'd hear him crunching on entire carrots and stalks of celery. He had boiled eggs every day for lunch that he'd leisurely peel at his desk. Every day for lunch, Marty would read the local newspaper beats. School meeting, borough meetings, church festival, he read it all. He drank five cups or more of coffee a day. If he was having technological issues, you could hear him swearing and muttering, hitting the computer with his fists. He had the loudest voice, and being in publishing, we conducted many phone interviews. He was stifling. One time, he switched into an empty office to conduct an interview with someone, and even with the door closed down the hall, we heard his entire conversation. Marty ended up leaving, taking another job, except the job actually didn't pan out. We're not sure if he didn't get it and thought he had it, or the place was just sleazy, but the project he was hired for didn't happen. So he ended up getting fired or laid off because they already found his replacement when he handed in his two weeks notice. It's a shame, really. He was in so much debt from his law degree and hated the work so much. He wasn't even practicing. He had the worst attitude in life and certainly wasn't pleasant, but he wasn't mean either. He was very punctual and extremely intelligent. He wasn't the only that guy in the office either. Before him, there was a large salesman, Ben. Ben would hang around office doorways and trap you there, talking to you inanely about anything, but usually whatever health issues he was having that week, in detail. He made up theme songs for our company and would sing them. He wanted to record it and have it on the website. He didn't smell good. He was a hugger. After he was fired, he continued, and still continues, at least according to my ex-coworkers, to send out holiday e-cards. I like hearing about the different personalities and characters that can be found in a workplace. Marty sounds like he had a tough time in life, with a job he didn't enjoy and a marriage he seemed to hate. It's a shame that things didn't work out for him at his new job, but hopefully he was able to find something that suited him better in the end. Ben, on the other hand, sounds like he had some quirks that might have made him difficult to work with. But it's nice to hear that he still keeps in touch with his former co-workers through holiday e-cards. Story 2 When I was temp at an office, I got put into the same cubicle block as that lady. Some highlights. She had these frightening wild eyes. I always got the sense that she wasn't quite right mentally, just because there was something so wrong with her eyes, something I could never put my finger on. Also, she exclusively wore polo shirts, which is also creepy. She had a special wrist brace that she wore every single day, for carpal tunnel, I guess. If anyone else touched it, even by accident, she flipped out and threw a fit. She hated scents of any kind. No one was allowed to wear perfume or use an air freshener around her, or else she would yell at the top of her voice. In the same vein, she refused to let anyone near her keep a plant or a quiet radio on their desks. She would wait until everyone else had gone to lunch before going, and she made sure to lock all her file cabinets and drawers. She was extremely paranoid that we'd go through her things when she wasn't there, This was a bad case of the pot calling the kettle black since she went through other people's drawers on a regular basis. She's also going through people's emails if they don't lock their computers before leaving and prints out copies of incriminating messages. She kept a printed copy of every single email she received from coworkers so she'd have a written record if she needed to tattle on anyone. Yes, that was the reason she gave for this. She purposely trained me wrong so she could complain to the boss that I wasn't doing my work right, I didn't find this out until my last week there when another intern watched me work and figured it out. That lady also took the work I did complete correctly and changed the name on it from mine to hers, then complained that I was slacking off. 
If anyone called her out on any of this, she'd dissolve into tears and throw a tantrum. People tried to get her fired a lot, but she'd claim that it was discrimination since she was a woman and a lesbian, and HR would drop the issue. The other intern and I got really passive-aggressive around her. We'd apply the strongest-smelling lotion we had every time that lady walked by. When we got back from lunch and found that lady hadn't returned yet, we'd douse her cubicle in body spray. I also created a fake set of login information and pinned it to my cubicle wall. It drove her crazy trying to figure out how to access my computer using an ID and password that didn't exist. Ooh, I would not want to work with that lady. Her behavior is definitely not acceptable, and I would understand why her coworkers tried to get her fired. However, mental illness could have been a factor in her behavior and wild eyes. Regardless, it's never okay to purposefully train someone wrong or go through others' personal belongings without permission. Story 3. New hire in the dev department, we shall call him Peter. Peter makes people uncomfortable. He's the kind of guy whose every action makes others uncomfortable. His jokes are entirely inappropriate and leave you feeling uncomfortable. We are not prudes by any stretch, but this guy just says the wrong things. This could be dealt with or ignored, but what happened on April 1st of this year caused me to lose any possible shred of respect for the man. 7.30 a.m., our early bird IT guy shows up, first in the office. 7.45 a.m., Peter shows up. 8.15 a.m., our lead architecture shows up, notices things are amiss. List of pranks are as follows. Boss's chair is missing. Every desktop PC's Ethernet has been pulled. $200 worth of coffee is missing, purchased the day before. Pole chains inside all four toilets are missing. Inside door handle of men's bathroom has been removed. Infinite loop of this door locked, use other door signs on our two entrances. First off, we have a pretty lax policy on working from home. You're permitted up to two days per week to work from home, and our devices regularly remote desktop into their machines. So pulling the ethernet from every desktop machine was a pretty crappy thing to do. Second, we didn't discover the inside door handle was missing until after our lead architect entered said bathroom and closed the door, locking himself in. He got a bit claustrophobic and was seconds away from breaking the door down before we managed to get it open. So the pranks really disrupted the office that day. By 10 a.m., emails have gone out requesting the person responsible please return the pull chains, door handle, coffee, and chair. The day goes on. No one admits to pulling the pranks. We are a very tight-knit group that has worked together for years. Peter is the only new guy at this time. No one has ever pulled a prank like this before. So we have motive and opportunity pointing to Peter being the culprit. He is directly confronted and denies it. It is at this point that I and many others in the office lost all respect for Peter, and he has never really recovered. I expect him to be gone within a few months. Oh, and the missing parts did eventually show up, one piece at a time, in and around various people's desks, and a desktop coffee maker was anonymously gifted to the lead architect with no note. Why can't the sucker just admit to it and let us all move on? Well, with a wild day like that in the office, I can understand why you and your coworkers were frustrated with Peter's prank. It's one thing to pull harmless pranks that bring a little levity to the workplace, but it's quite another to disrupt productivity and make people feel uncomfortable. And the fact that he denied it, even though there was evidence pointing to him, is definitely not a good look. Story 4. Let me tell you about that guy in my office. I could not make this guy up. He defied what I thought was possible in a person's behavior. We'll call him Pat. Let's get this out of the way. Pat wears sweaters with a monogram of his initials on the collar. Pat is older, probably in his late 50s or 60s, but dyes his hair a wretched shade of blonde. This contrasts grossly with his reddish sunburned skin. He tans very poorly, but is out in the sun a lot due to the one hobby I know him to have, running. His music of choice in his office is classical, especially waltzes that sound like they were the soundtrack of the Third Reich. He rarely stays the entire length of meetings. He will just peace out halfway through and never come back. He has a pompous and overly disciplined demeanor. I cannot imagine Pat in a relaxed state. He is always hiding behind a wall of professionalism. He sits and walks perfectly straight, never slouching. When speaking, he uses each word carefully and enunciates everything with intent. He uses certain phrases over and over again, like, let's add this as an action item, that'll be just fine, and, well, to be perfectly frank, the latter is ironic because Pat is never frank. He is the epitome of elusiveness. Everything he says is a mystery because he has no idea what he is talking about, so he hides behind riddles of BS. 
If you were to walk into his office with a question about ketchup, you would leave not knowing what ketchup was anymore. One time I was working on a deliverable to a customer, a data call response regarding an upcoming solicitation. I went around the company asking for assistance because it required more than the knowledge I had. I was making decent progress, but there were a couple questions that people kept referring me to ask Pat about, since they fit his area of expertise. I went into his office with the questions in hand. It's his customer's deliverable, so I thought he would be concerned and interested to help. I let him know I'm nearly done and just need his help on a couple of questions. He responds with one word, no, and he stares at me unexpectedly. I have no idea how he thought I would respond. I was a bit flabbergasted and just said, okay, I guess I'll keep working on it then, and walked out. I've got a handful of stories similar to this. No one likes this guy. He is occasionally sharp, but for the most part, fumbles and hides behind pseudo-intelligence. He is extremely self-conscious and concerned about his image at the company. Good thing he is retiring soon. Took out a bad stereotype. Story 5. That guy at my current company is John. John is a conspiracy theorist who believes that the anti-theft RFID things at the doors of Walmart are designed to scan your credit cards and the metal strip of money in your wallet to see how much money you have to spend. John talks about secret CIA trains that run in tunnels under the city. John used to work for a cell phone company and tells us stories of how he installed scanners on light poles on nearly every major road to scan for a unique identifier that all vehicles emit for government tracking purposes. John believes the building we work in has chemicals applied to the HVAC system, which is making us more compliant with government programs. John will never use his ATM card to buy meals because he doesn't want the government to track what he eats. John calls a $20 bill a yuppie meal coupon. I actually thought that one was funny. Ice cream is called whipped lard. Eating at Panda Express is eating an endangered species meal. John once told me about his collection of different sized rubber gloves he has at home. He has a pair that goes up to his shoulders for cleaning the bathroom. Sadly, John quit a few months ago. On the day he quit, he sat in his car in the parking garage for four hours before he worked up the guts to call his boss on the phone and quit. He instructed that his desk be boxed up and sent to his home. No one has heard from John since. Oh, just thought of some more. John also believed that all major leaders of the world belong to the same family tree. Also, our building has anti-earthquake devices attached to it, so the building shakes gently ever so often. John claimed that the shakes were the CIA shooting mind control beams up from the underground trains. John believes our secretary at the front desk keeps a log of when John entered and left the building. Most days, John would ride the train to work, and every so often he would say, better stay indoors, they're spraying again. Spraying mind control drugs, that is. I forgot to mention that he made custom tinfoil hats that he used to sell on the web. Unfortunately, I don't have a link. He also made jester hats with detachable bells, so you could wash them without the bells getting rusty from the water. Well, I hope John is doing okay wherever he is, and continues to find fulfillment in his hobbies and interests whether that be making tinfoil hats or something else entirely. But it is funny to think about the different ways people see the world and what they believe, though it's also important to be respectful and understanding of others best we can, even if we don't always agree with them. Story 6. At my old job, there was a girl named Shelly. I had been there for about a year and a half when she was hired, working as key holder, assistant manager, optician of a very small two-doctor, two-optician, one other employee, private optometry practice. The practice itself was owned by a husband and wife. The husband worked at the store I was in, while the wife had a store up in New York. She was allegedly a friend of the other employee, a kind of mousy Colombian girl who was sweet, if a bit naive, and adverse to working. Initially, Shelley was kind of a dipwit, which was fine. Apparently, they'd hired her on as a manager or something, despite the fact we didn't need one, and she was trying to throw her weight around. It was annoying, but life goes on. She starts getting really close to the owner of the store, oftentimes going into the office and closing the door for meetings, which uh, seemed kind of shady, because when you combine that sort of secrecy for the puppy eyes they were giving each other, it's obvious what's going on. From there, they got really touchy. We have cameras, not sure why they do that. And she started taking money out of the register while the owner gave her permission. For a store pulling in maybe $800 a day, Taking $1 to $200 of that money was pretty crappy. We stopped getting commission around that time. She was also just really lazy and rude to the customers. 
so much so that we had a bunch of them who would refuse to see her. Giving discounts and good service to her friends is one thing, but charging everyone else like crazy to make up for it? No. After about four months of this, the owner's wife comes in and asks me point blank what's going on. I tell her it isn't my place, but, well, it is what it is. Apparently, the owner's wife finally called some of her old employers, and it turns out that Shelly runs this kind of scam all the time. She gets hired, gets cozy with someone in charge, and then cries assault for money, gifts, etc. She got a bunch of clothes from another store this way, and a BMW too, which kind of blew my mind. The next day, Shelly got fired because, and I quote, I'm not paying you to sleep with my husband. Story 7. At my last job, we had a couple. I'll go with the one story that translates best to type. So we'll call him Kurt. If Kurt wasn't gay, then he had everyone in the company fooled. No one cared, mind you, it's just an important detail to the story. He was regularly referred to as a witch. Kurt was the kind of guy that would pick a target and then very openly flirt with that guy for a while. It didn't matter how straight, married, or uninterested you were, Kurt was going to get his flirt on. When my one friend grew a goatee, Kurt went up to him and said something along the lines of, Oh, I like this, and stroked his face. Another time, my other friend was in the kitchen heating up his lunch when Kurt walked in. I was in earshot of the kitchen, so I heard this all going on. First, Kurt asks him to get his lunch from the fridge for him. Naturally, it's on the bottom shelf, and my friend, being the unconditionally nice person he is, obliged. I'm already laughing so hard for the blatant and stereotypical office gender harassment situation, but then Kurt took it to a whole other level, proving he's a pro. Now he has to explain why he's unable to bend over and get his own lunch. It's because his balls are swollen to the size of grapefruits. The graphic description is accompanied with hand gestures down by his groin to give a really solid visual. Kurt went on for no less than five minutes talking about how big and sensitive his balls are. It was glorious. My poor friend is too nice to just say, gross dude, and walks away. So he's trying to walk away with lunch in hand without being a dong. By the time he got back to his cube, I had tears in my eyes and my face was red from trying not to laugh out loud. This has set the bar to the greatest thing I've seen in a professional environment. Oh man, this story certainly had me laughing. It's always interesting to see the characters that show up in our workplaces, and Kurt sounds like quite the character, with his open flirting and graphic descriptions of his swollen balls. Kudos to your friend for being a good sport and not being a dong about the situation, but sometimes you do gotta speak up. Story 8. I used to work at Best Buy right out of high school, selling appliances in a forgotten corner of the store where everyone goes to steal things. Fridge Isle provides some nice visual coverage when opening DVD cases, it's a pretty well-known fact that Best Buy only employs the finest of the finest when it comes to morons. But this guy acted like he had no clue how to interact with people. Store meeting. We have to roleplay a sales scenario in front of everyone. He's playing the customer. When I ask for his fictional name, he responds with a term he picked up from our coworker earlier that week. Mr. Duck Butter explodes into a fit of giggles. Everyone else is silently horrified or confused. I'm selling a crummy washer-dryer set to a landlord. I worked at a Best Buy situated across the street from an area routinely subject to drug busts and intense police scrutiny, as it is ridiculously ghetto. I pitched the landlord the service plan. He's not going for it, as his future tenants are likely too drug-addled to use the machines anyway. Duck Butter is standing by and decides to help me with my sales, employing all one month of his sales experience. In the most awkward and condescending manner possible, he proceeds to nag my customer the entire time I'm scheduling the pickup and processing the sale. Customer is visibly enraged and threatens to leave. Duck Butter finally concedes with, All right, your funeral. Routinely disappeared throughout the day only to turn up in random departments alienating customers. Coincidentally did this every time actual work was involved. Had various ailments that prevented him from doing any physical task whatsoever, which ruled out any possibility of usefulness in appliance sales. As soon as he started working, our department got an influx of customer survey responses on how weird he was. He frequently had customers request to see another salesperson in the middle of his sales. The times I would go to check on his sale or take over, I would always be met with someone visibly uncomfortable or angry. It seems like Best Buy really went all out to hire the cream of the crop when it comes to employees. I mean, who wouldn't want to work with someone like Mr. Duckbutter? He sounds like a real gem. 
I can imagine the look on everyone's face when he revealed his fictional name during a store meeting roleplay. If that's not the pinnacle of professionalism, I don't know what is. Story 9. I work with an appliance salesman named Henry. Henry is a 60-year-old Colombian dude from Miami that talks fast and with a stammer. He's 5 foot nothing, about 200 pounds, and looks like George Costanza. Henry clogged the toilet and it overflowed. He then asked me to get a mop and clean it up. I'm not the janitor, and no. Constantly tells customers he's telling the truth about an appliance and price and says that he is not working on commission. He just loves helping people get what they want. He is on commission. He adds warranties and overpriced cleaners to customers' orders without telling them, and 70% of the time the customers don't notice because they're spending 20 to 30 grand anyway. He's in the top 10 in the company in accessory sales. He stammers a lot, especially when he gets defensive. He coaches a high school boys basketball team on the weekends and wears this gaudy championship ring on his finger like he's Phil Jackson. Oh, and his kids don't even go to that school, and they never have. A black woman asked him for assistance, and he said, I'll be right with you, sister. Everyone has an impression of him. He blames others for his mistakes. He bought an 18-year-old Lexus, it is Cherry, from his neighbor to replace his 20-year-old SUV. He drives that thing around like he's the shiznit. Parks it really far from everyone else for fear of someone touching it and constantly informs people that he drives a luxury car. Oh, you have a BMW? I drive a Lexus myself. Great handling. He recently started riding the bus because he claims it's more relaxing for his 30-mile commute. We all suspect that something broke on the Lexus. He threw a pan on the floor, we have promotional pans and knife sets, and yelled, Bam! There's your freebie! to a customer. He calls people dude and bro. Always talks about his P90X that he's doing. It's been 10 months, and he looks the same. Refers to Asians as Orientals. Story 10. About six or so years ago, my company hired a new engineer who, on paper, was absolutely amazing. His degree, his employment history, and his past project list of achievements was one of the most impressive I have ever seen. But holy smokes, was he weird. Here's a quick recap of some of the things I can remember. Frequently, he walked around the office during normal business hours with no shoes on, just his pink socks. Sometimes seen pulling up his shirt to wipe his mouth after eating or to blow his nose. Office had a pretty standard don't go crazy with hanging things on the walls policy. This guy happened to have the end cube of a row, so he had a full wall which he blanketed from floor to ceiling with pictures his kids drew in art class. So imagine a wall with 120 8x11 finger paintings on it. Also, did I mention he glued them to the wall and it had to be repainted when they were removed? Would play pinball on his laptop during project meetings, sometimes getting tired and laying his face down on the keyboard to take a nap. Once showed up to an off-site meeting at 7 a.m. eating creamed spinach. Maybe not odd to anyone else, but it almost made me vomit. Later that day, we all took a break at lunch to walk around the town we were in for 30 minutes or so. When we got back to the meeting, he wasn't with us, even though he had been following us the entire time. Two hours later, he came walking back in because he got lost. He said the reason he got separated from us was that he had seen some rose hips growing in one of the locals' yards. So he let himself in and proceeded to eat them. Eventually, we fired him for, I don't even remember, for being crazy, I guess. The next day, someone called in a bomb threat to the daycare across the street from our building. Ooh, I'm not sure what to make of the bomb threat, but it seems like it may have been a little too coincidental. Maybe he was trying to get back at us for letting him go. Or maybe he was just trying to get a little excitement in his life after being cooped up in an office all day. It's unfortunate that his strange behavior led to his dismissal. It sounds like he had some impressive qualifications, but just couldn't quite fit into a typical office setting. Hopefully he found a job where he could thrive and be his unique, quirky self. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.